Hi, this is Mike Hart, and I'm joined today by Rachel Kerrigan, Keisha Ross-Williams, and Brittany Suggs. We are giving you an overview of experiential therapy, and we'll include in our discussion existential, gestalt, and emotion-focused therapy. Existential therapy is a type of experiential therapy, but more recently it's been associated with humanistic approaches. Existential is based on the assumption that some psychological disorders are the result of an individual's inability to reconcile themselves with certain characteristics of human condition and finding meaning or purpose in one's life. So overall, the existential theory was birthed out of an existential crisis. So the founding philosophers, each of them faced some type of dilemma in their life. The father of existentialism, Soren Kierkegaard, was a Danish theologian and philosopher who sought out to examine the big picture regarding the individual and how they interpreted the environment from their worldview. So psychopathology is characterized by an overemphasis on one level of being at the expense of an, another level of being, such as being one with family, expense of being in nature or being of oneself. And Jean-Paul Sartre was credited for being the first one to use the term existential. And his most decorated work was being and nothingness, where he challenged the worldview at the time that he believed embraced oppression and spiritually destruction conformity. And instead, he endorsed striving towards an authentic state of being. Human suffering is considered the result of a person's inability to reconcile beliefs in the face of tragedy. So this existential anxiety comes about when they can't reconcile what they grew up believing versus some adversity that they're now facing. And all psychological symptoms are a result of the, their decision to be inauthentic about what they're experiencing. To be healthy, the individual must embrace both the freedom and the responsibility that comes along with being their true self. We must address both the subjective and the objective part of that individual, meaning we have to look at the private and emotional side of them as well as what they're publicly showing. Some basic assumptions about the theory include the capacity for self-awareness, that we are finite beings with limited time on this earth, and that we have the potential to act or not act, and that meaning is not automatically bestowed but discovered and created. Freedom and responsibility involves the belief that individuals are free to choose from alternatives and therefore have a significant role in shaping their destinies. The identity and relationship to others is based on the um, premise that our identities tend to be based on what others expect from us versus us trusting ourselves to search within ourselves to find our own answers. Searching for meaning involves the human struggle and search for significance and purpose in life. Existential therapy can provide the conceptual framework to help clients explore these questions, such as, do you like the direction of your life? Or are you pleased with what you are now and what you are becoming? The anxiety and condition of life regarding that one, existential therapy asserts that the therapist's job is not to make the client's life easier, but to encourage them to deal with their insecurities and face their anxieties. The awareness of death and non-being is not viewed by the existentialist as something that is negative. Death is a part of the human condition that gives significance to an individual's life. The therapeutic approach involves um, not medication, but self-reflection, philosophical exploration, and the expansion of one's awareness and acceptance of the human condition that they're facing. It explores four major themes, including death and their how they view it, their freedom of choice, isolation in comparison to others, and meaninglessness in life. The goals of therapy would then include, through courageous honesty, the client would become more authentic and increase their level of consciousness, and for the client to experience themselves as capable of directing their own lives through active choosing, and for the client to accept that responsibility for the choice that they make. Use of existential confrontation and honest feedback is also key, though they also believe in unconditional positive regard. That was just for relationship building, but they require the confrontation in order to get to the honest feedback. Phenomenology is the primary method for understanding the person of psychotherapy, and that's just a study of the individual from their perspective and their point of view. Some strengths and weaknesses of this approach 
includes that some critics say that it's too, too simplistic in nature and that it doesn't offer any specific techniques and that it's seen as more of a philosophy of psychotherapy versus an actual therapeutic method. And there are very little studies conducted that proves its effectiveness. To some, it appears unsuitable for ethnical or racial minorities seeking relief because it was developed by white male elitists, citing that the approach ignores the realistic context of people's lives. Gestalt therapy is one of the most well-known of the experiential therapies. It's known for its dynamic founder, Fritz Perls, and its focus on here and now using some specific awareness raising techniques. The founder of Fritz Perls was born in Germany and was a psychoanalyst trained at Freud. Seeing what was going on in Nazi Germany and the rise of Hitler, um, Perls fled Germany and went to South Africa, where he and his wife, Laura, founded a psychoanalyst institute. He later fled there as well to flee the regime as apartheid rose in South Africa. And Fritz and Laura then moved to the United States, where they founded the New York Institute for Gestalt Therapy in New York in 1946. Pearls was known for having a strong, even egotistical, and very dynamic personality that in many ways became part and parcel with Gestalt Therapy. Gestalt Theory views human beings mostly in light of their existence as biological organisms driven to maintain balance. They maintain balance and bring wholeness to their organism by becoming aware of needs like survival, hunger, sex, breathing, shelter, and then meeting that need. And after that need is met or extinguished, they become aware of the next need and seek to bring completion to that. Gestalt emphasizes the individual's ability to self-regulate and self-actualize and therefore places emphasis squarely on the individual with no excuses or manipulation. Gestalt theory originally avoided language of major mental health diagnosis and instead spoke in terms of growth disorders or boundary disturbances that would arise when an individual becomes stuck in the process of growth. So the levels of psychopathology, according to Gestalt, include the phony, where one plays out ideals or expectations by acting as if they were someone else. The phobic, where we avoid our emotional pain, such as fears related to catastrophic expectations born in childhood, like that if we truly assert our own independence, we'll end up losing the love of our parents. The impasse, representing the place where we got stuck in our maturation or development. The implosive layer, where we experience the deadness of the parts of ourselves that we've disowned. And the explosive layer, where we finally burst into the experience of being fully alive. Primary hallmark of Gestalt therapy in practice is that both therapist and client must remain present centered in the here and now. Through the therapeutic process, the client becomes aware of how they play the phony through their roles and expectations they take on. They recognize their attempts to run and avoid. And meanwhile, the therapist's role is to keep the client grounded in the here and now and also to keep them responsible. The therapist is less concerned with the need to maintain unconditional positive regard an area where Pearls differed significantly from other humanistic approaches and with Carl Rogers. Pearls believe that a therapeutic relationship may be helpful, but the change could actually occur without it. Gestalt therapists are highly attuned to nonverbals and draw attention to the body to heighten awareness. And the height of the therapeutic process in Gestalt, catharsis or dramatic relief through laying down their phony roles or attempts to avoid and instead outwardly expresses their inner experiences. Gestalt therapists may use a variety of techniques to bring awareness, take responsibility, or to foster clients expressing their inner experience. So I'll highlight a couple. Using an empty chair technique, a therapist may facilitate a client speaking directly to a parent represented by the empty chair in order to express feelings from their inner experience that they normally wouldn't feel comfortable to say to their parent or perhaps even to anyone. In a reversals game or exercise, the client acts and expresses the opposite of their usual expressions and behaviors in order for them to bring the part of themselves they normally hide or avoid. Gestalt tends to be brief, and in fact, Pearls worked more in the realm of groups and workshops where people might only attend a single session. Sessions and groups are highly engaging, interactive, and in a group or workshop format, people can experience catharsis and gain insight even without being the one on the hot seat. Gestalt is not recommended for clients with severe symptoms or delinquency, acting out, or impulse control issues. Gestalt also lags behind in regard to scientific evidence of effectiveness, and because of its lack of empirical support, Gestalt therapists may have to be creative in the area of insurance reimbursement or just be comfortable working in the realm of private pay. Gestalt has been criticized for lack of cultural relevance, partly due to its highly individualistic orientation and partly because of its unwavering emphasis on individual responsibility, which critics feel can be dismissive of social problems and forces like poverty and racism, et cetera. So some modern Gestalt practitioners and educators fire back, though, that Gestalt is at its core a social justice and non-adjustment therapy, meaning that as a core principle of Gestalt, a person who would be considered a minority is not required or even encouraged to adjust to the majority culture. A person is able to be the judge of his or her own standards of health. 
So in our class session, we're going to practice an exercise called I take responsibility, where the client ends every statement with and I take responsibility for it. And then we're also going to play um, a game or exercise called playing the projection where you act out the other person, the object of your projection and kind of speak from their point of view. And we'll do this in a fishbowl format. You have volunteer experts to play that role of the therapist. All right, I'm going to speak for a few minutes on emotion focused therapy. This is a modern example of experiential therapy that is the most empirically validated theory we'll discuss today. EFT was first developed in the 1980s by Les Greenberg and Sue Johnson, who, as Sue Johnson, has made great contributions to couples, EFT especially, and understanding the role of unmet attachment needs in relationships. Les Greenberg is often seen as the face of EFT and he actually came from an engineering background, not a counseling background, and he had a bit of an existential crisis himself when he realized he did not enjoy the engineering um, discipline that he had studied for so many years. So he left South Africa where he was living at the time and moved to Canada to study psychology at York University. He, there he got training in both person-centered and gestalt therapy um, during his education, and then he mirrored uh, you can see both of those things mirrored in EFT. He currently is back at York University where he runs the Emotion Focused Therapy Clinic in Toronto. He, um, through this experience of coming to realize this satisfaction in his early career, he came out believing that feelings are vital to the human experience and that too many people cut feelings off. Feeling deeply is unique and important. And his passion for scientific investigation contributes to the fact that EFT is highly researched and empirically validated. It is a, it, it, he believes that clients get stuck when they fail to fully experience all dimensions of their reality, which includes emotions. But not only is there this emphasis on experiencing emotions, but also on emotional intelligence and emotional regulation. And on the next slide here, we can see kind of the three steps here of awareness, regulation, and then coming to transform um, the experience into reality, the, and how it plays out in your life. In healthy individuals, emotion is seen as congruent with the situation and aids in necessary and fitting action decisions. And I've linked a YouTube video here for you to watch on your own time with Greenberg explaining what um, emotion, how emotion can change emotion. The strengths of EFT are especially um, clear with Christian clients. It may be in line with Christian therapists and clients than other experiential methods, partly because it's such a holistic view of persons. It allows for cognition, values, and beliefs to be prioritized. Relationships and attachment are given a primary role, and EFT may even aid in forgiveness. EFT is highly researched, it's empirically validated, to, especially with couples and in treating depression. In one study, 70 to 73% of couples demonstrated recovery after only eight to 12 sessions, which is pretty remarkable. It's also been used to treat trauma, which is one of my emphases, and so I was interested in that. And I, um, although I, there are some clear guidelines to use with trauma, I would use it with caution because um, due to the possibility of flooding clients with their emotions, they need first to learn self-regulation skills. And one study here highlights that. It's also contraindicated, as many experiential therapies are, with a more serious thought disorders and disturbed individuals. And as highlighted a bit earlier too, it's another very individualistic approach. And in couples counseling where especially one person might not be from the, if, if you have a, a dual an interracial couple and one person doesn't come from an individualistic place or you're working individually with someone from a cross-cultural setting, um, you need to be careful that it's not offensive to be such so focused on individual um, experiences. And there aren't a lot of assessments in EFT uh, but there, I, I would always suggest that it's good practice to assess for thought disorders and trauma and attachment assessments may be helpful in couples therapy. Here on the right, I talk about a few techniques in EFT, including um, the two chair technique, which was described a bit earlier and depression and um, couples work has specific things that need to be highlighted when doing EFT. Next, we're gonna do a class practice with experiential intervention for emotional suppression that we would use up an, act an activity called Bottled Up. We will describe that further in class. So now we've come to the ethical considerations for experiential therapy. When we take a look 
at the different ethical guidelines. We have the American Counseling Association, the American Association of Christian Counselors, and KCREP standards that provide guidance in terms of ethical considerations. Here we're going to briefly cover just a few ethical considerations. So beginning with individual responsibility versus social responsibility. This is a big one for gestalt therapy. And what we're looking at here in terms of taking responsibility is some concerns related to um, the possibility of neglecting social interaction and engagement. There's the potential for harm to the individual. There's, the, again, the rejection of social uh, responsibility and the risk of victim blaming. So a recommended balance is balancing that therapy with a cognitive or interpersonal approach. When we look at competence versus creativity, so experiential therapies are definitely known for the creative opportunities that it invites for its clinicians and counselor educators. However, there's always a concern with any theory related to competence. So some of the recommendations in order to curb those ethical, um, those potential ethical risks include extensive training for anyone who's embarking on experiential therapies, especially for techniques that um, invite a great propensity for emotional carcasses and um, therapy for the counseling professional, um, just to make sure that there are safeguards against unfinished business. So when we look at the challenge versus the coercion, so we know that with experiential therapies, there is a great draw to invite the person to take the lead and take control over their therapeutic process. But the equal counter or risk is the potential for um, the individual to experience a social pressure or to feel that they are being shamed into participation. So in order to curb this ethical concern, um, there's always the consideration for the respect for the individual choice and autonomy, and of course, following the individual's lead during an exercise. And lastly, when we look at the last ethical consideration component, this one is specific to counselor educators. So um, when we look at the research, there is a propensity towards research bias and a legion effect. We see this most specifically when looking at the empirical significance of gestalt therapy in comparison to cognitive behavioral therapy. The allegiance effect says that an individual has a slant towards their own preferred theoretical orientation. So when evaluating research studies related to experiential therapy, specifically gestalt therapies, take a discerning eye that there is a statistical control there for the allegiance effect. The spiritual integration and faith-based perspectives on experiential therapies. If we look at the tenets of experiential therapies in comparison to some of the biblical principles, there are a number of considerations. For example, with Gestalt and its significant importance that it places on individualism and the propensity for social problems to only be seen as an excuse for not taking responsibility for one's own behavior, we do have a counter to that. We are our brother's keeper. So again, that's where that um, spiritual integration piece meets that social responsibility and engagement piece. Again, with Gestalt, there is a great propensity also to believe in individuals having the inner resourcefulness to resolve problems and presenting concerns. And we see that alignment in terms of spiritual and faith-based beliefs. We have an eternal helper in the Holy Spirit to guide us through and help us to navigate life's challenges. With emotional-focused therapy, there is a balance between the emotional and interpersonal perspectives. So just that mindfulness not to be governed fully and solely by emotions, but to make sure that we temper things um, with a very level perspective. And lastly, with experiential, um, there's a belief that emotional awareness brings about wisdom. And while emotional awareness does bring about awareness, just a reminder, too, that we cannot be governed solely by our emotions, or at least that's the biblical principle to that. And also the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge. So now that we've looked at existential gestalt and emotion focused therapy, we want to review the case of Annie and determine what you feel like the client's issues are as far as conceptualization. And then we want to look at which of the three experiential theories would you utilize and why, and then discuss how you would apply these theories to address what you conceptualize as the client's issues. Additional questions to consider is what else would you want to know and would you utilize any assessment tools 
uh, or incorporate any assessment tools. This concludes our presentation.